I'm really pleased uh, to be here uh, with uh, all of you this evening. Uh, some of the things I'm going to say may seem uh, shocking at first, uh, but I assure you that uh, uh, I'm not presenting uh, uh, just opinions. I'm going to start with data, then some interpretations of data, and I uh, welcome uh, the idea that you will challenge everything that I say. The purpose of, of my being here, first of all, I didn't invite myself. I want to thank uh, the PAC group for inviting me, but having been invited, I thought I would want to take advantage of this opportunity and tell you what I think is happening to our beloved state system. And I'm going to lay it out the way I think uh, uh, it is. And uh, I take sole responsibility for it. And I sign my name to it. So uh, I, I have no agenda. I'm not criticizing anyone. I'm not blaming anyone. I'm just going to lay it out uh, uh, the way it is. So uh, we handed out that uh, paper to you. There will be no test. Uh, but I wanted you to have that. I was thinking of, of you when I was preparing for this. And I thought, I have slides to show you. And you don't have to bother taking notes, because anything that I'm about to say is already there. So you can just take that with you. Um, the slides will speak for themselves. Both an electronic copy of that paper and an electronic copy of the slides are already on our website, calu.edu. Look for About Us, Meet the President, and then there's another thing called Presentations. It's there. So feel free to share it with whomever you like. Um, uh, it's, uh, it represents my work. Some of the things I'm going to share with you this evening, I did not know three weeks ago. I did not know. I was analyzing data, and I discovered something, and I almost fell over when I discovered it. I'm going to share it with you tonight. Now, some of the things I'm going to talk about, some of you have heard before. You've heard about declining public support and being privatized without a plan. I'm going to start there for, this, for the benefit of those who are not familiar with that. But there are two other ideas I'm going to bring up that I've never discussed publicly before. I haven't discussed them with anyone. In fact, today at our uh, Commission of Presidents meeting, since the executive session of the board went on so long, uh, we had plenty of time. We ran out of things to talk about. So I shared with my colleague presidents what I was going to talk about this evening, and we had a very, very interesting uh, discussion. Um, finally, this is not going to take long for me to go through these slides. Uh, and I want to let you know now that I'm, I'll be eager to hear any questions or comments that you have about this. It is my hope that there will be, this will start a conversation, because I think we desperately need one. And who better to have that conversation than the people who care the most about these universities? OK. I'm honored to speak, as I said. I hope I don't disappoint you, especially the people who invited me. And I'm hoping that this will actually help, that something good will come out of this. It's rare to have so many luminaries, um, members of the board, the chancellor, trustees, the presidents, and so on. In fact, we also have, and many of you probably don't know this, we also have the people who run the president's offices. We have Dee Stalvey, who taught me how to be a president. We have the young woman who taught Bob Dillman. Uh, and uh, they're sitting at a table back there, a couple of tables. Why don't you, why don't you uh, folks stand up and be recognized? Come on. They're so shy. Thank you. And for those presidents who retire, they'll be training the next one who comes. OK. We're here. We are really the stewards, in a sense, in the best sense of that word. Stewardship have responsibility for preserving these wonderful universities. OK. Um, I was trained as a physicist, and whenever we did publications in physics, it was required that you have an abstract. You have to say right up front what the punchline is, otherwise people don't bother <laughs> reading any farther. Okay? So I thought uh, this abstract is on two slides. So my goal, since I was asked to speak on the future of, the, of public higher education in Pennsylvania, I'm going to confront that question. Two kinds of information, as I said, data interpretations. Here's the punchline. Based on my analysis, I've concluded that if the funding and policy trends of the past 27 years continue, public higher ed in Pennsylvania will disappear and become a thing of the past in one more generation. I do not mean that the buildings will go away. and I don't mean that the students won't still come to them. I don't mean that at all. What I'm saying is that public higher ed's historic mission will be rendered unattainable. It will be impossible to achieve the um, uh, the mission of higher ed as it was conceived in Pennsylvania um, with Act 188. Um, as public higher ed and its students become increasingly marginalized and abandoned by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. 
Now, I'm going to make three assertions. And you know, an assertion is a statement which I claim is true, and then it's up to you to decide whether it is. And I'm going to present the evidence that I have that, that I think makes, can verify that those things are true. All right. First assertion is not news. Cal U and the other public universities in PA, I always put public in quotation marks because we're rapidly becoming private. Uh, universities in PA are being privatized without a plan. Um, this is new. The business model under which Pasha universities currently operate is financially unsustainable, and without changing key policies that drive that business model, Pasha universities will face se severe financial distress and bankruptcy in the near term. I know that's a provocative thing to say. I think I have the evidence to prove it. Assertion three, although the Pasha universities were intended to carry out the mission spelled out in Act 188, provide high quality education at the lowest possible cost to the students, the, the mission is not at the lowest possible cost. Some people say it that way, but it's lowest possible cost to the students. Um, the rapid decline in Commonwealth funding, which you'll see the charts for if you haven't seen them before, compounded by key operating policies, portend mission fuel failure. But, and the mission has two ends to it. High quality is on one end, lowest cost to the students is on the other. So if you don't accomplish either of those, I would say that's mission failure. Even if you, only, even if you accomplish one and not the other, you'd have to say, it's, it's also a mission failure as far as high quality education and lowest possible cost to the students. Okay. If what's past is prologue, as Shakespeare wrote in The Tempest, then what can we expect? Then the future of public higher ed will be, like its recent past, one of continuing decline in public support. We're going to talk about that. Document that there has been a decline and give the reasons for why anybody who, unless you believe in the tooth fairy and the Easter bunny, um, you can fully expect that that trend is not going to change. I think the evidence is pretty powerful that that trend is not going to change because it's happening for a very good reason, as we'll see. It's been 27 years since the first year of the state system. Commonwealth funding has declined precipitously. I looked that word up. It's like falling off a cliff. Um, I, I've long asserted that my institution was being privatized without a plan. The same, the same I believe, can be said of all 14 schools. And I'm saying now, is there evidence to back up that startling claim? Well, you check out the slides, you decide for yourself. What you have there are the funding trends. That, blue, that wavy blue line refers, that's 27 years worth of data. In 1983-84, the fiscal year when the state system first began, 63% of the budget for the past universities came from the state. In 2010, 9-10, you know, it's a fiscal year, it's down to 34%. So we basically went from getting two-thirds of our budget from the state to one-third of our budget from the state. At the same time, Penn State went from 46 to 19. In this day of uh, uh, Microsoft Office and Excel, it calculates the linear regression for you. So those straight lines are the closest fit you get to those trends. And it's a very easy thing. You remember your algebra class in high school. You set y equal to zero. And then you ask the question, when does that happen? It goes off the chart. But what you find is this. It's on the next slide. I'll just, OK. If you extrapolate those data, if the trends don't change, if we continue to be disinvested in by the Commonwealth, Penn State will be totally private, that is, zero state funds in 20 years, 20 years from 2010. Cal U and the other state system schools will be totally private in, thir in 31 years, totally private in the sense that we will be getting no money from the state. Now, that probably won't happen. You know, other states have done this kind of thing. In Virginia, Peter Garland tells me, uh, William & Mary gets 8% of its budget from the state and sort of leveled off there. And none of the rules have gone away. So that could be our fate, too. All right? So they're private, almost, in the sense of money. They're not necessarily private in the sense of the rules. Um, public higher ed could, uh, in fact, if that happens, uh, you have to say that public higher ed is a thing of, of the past at that point. Pennsylvania is not alone. It's happening to many of the states. This is what's happened. This is, this is the one you're, you've already seen, what's happened to the state. What you haven't seen is what has that done to the other people who are paying? Well, as state share went from 63 to 34, the share paid by tuition by students, the fees paid by st students, and other uh, made up the difference. So right now, that is at a higher percent, 66 compared to 63. So you can see where this is going. And that, I think, verifies that we are actually being privatized. I think it's a fair statement. OK. Now, the first time I showed those charts, uh, I had a legislator who was feeling very defensive. And I wasn't blaming him. Uh, and he said, well, you can't do that. 
Uh, you have to look at the dollars. Don't look at the percents. People don't buy groceries with percents. They buy it with dollars, which is a very good point. So I thought, OK. So I went back and I uh, looked at the funding trends in terms of dollars, which is easy to do. Uh, the uh, CPI is listed, and you can figure out how the value of the dollars deteriorates over time. So I actually looked at the uh, purchasing power, and here's what I found. If you look at the history, 27 years worth of history, that's how much money the state system got in, in 1984. It was in the range of about $230 million, okay? If you put in, if you calculate what the current, I'm sorry, the constant dollars would be in 2009, it was really like half a million today, okay? Those old dollars were worth more than, than a dollar would be today. So that's what the history is of constant dollars of the funding to the state system over the last 27 years. The high point was here, and the low point was there in 2009. So this is what it looks like in constant dollars. That's, that's what it looks like in current dollars. But while that was happening, something else absolutely amazing was happening. I never appreciated how significant this curve was until I actually thought about it. There has been a 52% increase in enrollment in the state system since it was created, 27 years. It went from 71,000 to 108,000 students in 27 years. If you put those two pieces of information together and you calculate what the PASHI appropriation was in constant dollars per FTE student, how many dollars are actually available to educate one student? And you look at that trend over 27 years, here's what you find. Between 1987, when they were getting over $7,000 in constant dollars to educate a student, it's now down here to 4,500. That's a 39% drop in purchasing power in that period of time. So I think that's evidence that we continue to be privatized because the, the money available from the state to do the education is shrinking in real terms. Here's another measure, very, very interesting. This is different. This is the percent of the Commonwealth's budget that comes to PASHI, right? The, the state has its budget. It gives out the money according to public policy. Where should the money go? There are always competing interests. And uh, if, and there's the linear extrapolation, the linear uh, uh, representation of those data. And you'll see this one's very volatile. And it's not volatile because the funding to the, to the system was volatile. It's volatile because of the business cycle. It's boom and bust. You go through the, the parts of the economy. Uh, uh, so it, it looks volatile. But the trend, I think, is pretty obvious. It's falling like a rock. So, uh, uh, in fact, I, uh, it went from about close to 3% of the state budget down to a little bit below 1.9. So that's like a 50% reduction in what we used to get from the state. And of course, the state budgets have grown over the years, too. They haven't stayed the same size. So uh, you have to be fair about that. These two years are very, very peculiar. Uh, and that's why we have an asterisk. Uh, I included the, the federal stimulus funds in all of this. I'm giving the state credit for that. So, so the real situation is actually worse than this in terms of you're looking at state, at state funding. Something funny happened uh, in 2009. Uh, we got the federal, I'm sorry, the state budget was, was passed. The federal stimulus money came, and then there was a rescission. The state took some of the money back. Uh, so that one is overstated also. That one doesn't really, it's really much shorter than that and so on. Anyway, th those are just minor things. Uh, but the 2011 cliff, as we talk about it, why is that? Because next year, the federal money goes away. There's a big question as to whether the state's going to be able to take us back to where we were. So that can be a scary thing. All right. You will not see this graph anywhere except if you get it from me because I created it, not, not initially. You can, get, you can get these reports for any one year that you want. You get on something called highereducation.org. They do something called a report card of the states. And they'll tell you how each state Spends, spends its money every year, and they use the same definition, so you can do some comparisons. But what I did was I put reports together for all these years so that you can see what the trend has been over these 18 years. 1990 was the first report. 2008 was the most recent one. Another one's going to be coming out here pretty soon, later in October. And here's the average of the 50 states for 2008. So what do you find? Over an 18-year period, K-12 went from getting 23% of the budget down to 19. So K-12 has been losing funding. Look at higher ed, 7 to 4. Look at cash assistance, what used to be called welfare, went from 6 to 2. 
Look at, I'm sorry, look at transportation went from a, uh, 13 down to 10, and then all the other categories bunched together are pretty flat. They're in the, pretty much in, in the 30s. So what's interesting about this? The only thing that's interesting to me is that there were only two categories that went up over 18-year period. And there were both Democrats and Republicans in charge during that 18-year period. Only two things went up. What were they? Medicaid went from 12 to 30% of the budget. Almost tripled in just 18 years. Corrections went from two to four. Now it's backed off a little bit. It's now two to three. By the way, they round these things off to one digit. So you understand? Uh, in other words, it, it clutters up the graph if you actually put it in another decimal point. And that's why you can go from a three to a four in one year. It was probably more like 3.49 one year, and it could be 3.51 the next. You understand what I'm saying? So I don't want to misrepresent what's going on here. But clearly, there's something powerful going on here. Uh, is PA being bankrupted by Medicaid? I think it is. And in fact, if you check uh, Ohio, New York, states like that, they're, they're experiencing exactly the same thing. And you don't have to believe me. How about Peter Orsag, who just retired as the uh, director uh, of the uh, Congressional Budget Office? This is a direct quote from him in the New York Times just a few weeks ago. Over recent decades, the state governments have devoted a larger share of resources to rising costs of Medicaid, the health care program for the poor. They have cut support for higher education. So it wasn't that the people in Washington didn't know that this was happening. Right? Medicaid has been growing, and they have to take the money from somewhere. This is what the tuition has looked like over 27 years. It was about $1,500, $1,500. Most recent time, this is not the last year. This, that's not the year we're in. It's last fiscal year. It's up to about $5,500. Um, this is what it is in terms of constant dollars, right? 1480 up to 5504. It was, that 1480 was really about 3000. Now it's up to 5500. That's a 74% increase in value of the actual money, though. That is, education has gotten more expensive in the sense it would take a larger share of the family budget, okay, when you do it in constant dollars, okay? You think the D's and the R's never agree? Here's something on which they all agree. The disinvestment has happened under both because in the last 18 years, over that, when that was happening, the last 27 years, you've had two Democratic governors as bookends and you had two Republicans in between. And the policy hasn't changed. Not only did you have D's and R's as governors, the Senate was Democratic when I joined the system in 1992. It's now been Republican for a while. The House has been back and forth several times. What does it say to you when you get the same trend? Look at any of those curves of funding going down. What's it say when the D's and the R's didn't matter who was in charge? That says it's fundamental. There's something going on here. As a physics major, I couldn't help it. I had to find a hypothesis. What could possibly explain that, that, the, that the, both parties would agree? I think it's demographic. I think it's fundamental. We are a republic based on majority rule, and the future of uh, higher ed is clouded I think, because it turns out from the demographics, if you look at the uh, Census Bureau data in 1950 and the year 2000, you find that the country changed tremendously. In 1950, 57% of the households had at least one person 18 or younger, somebody who could benefit from public higher ed. In 2000, it was 34%. What's that say? That says now two out of three voting households don't have a horse in that race. And they don't want their taxes raised to send somebody else's kid to college. That's my interpretation. So what does that mean? That means our politicians are smart. They can add. Um, so what do they do? Uh, uh, they realize that their constituents have other priorities. In fact, if you want to know what the priorities are, I'll take you back to that slide of how Pennsylvania spends its money. What were the two, only two things that went up? Crime and health uh, crime uh, health care. What does that say? That's, a, that's, what the, that's what the public was concerned about. That's why I'm not criticizing legislators. I'm not criticizing the governor. I'm not criticizing anybody. The demographic, demographics drive our democracy, do they not? We say majority rule. What's that mean? Well, sometimes you're in the minority. Guess what? You don't get, you don't get what you would have gotten before. So that's why I criticize no one. So I say those two-thirds of the voting households may not want their taxes raised to send someone else's son or daughter to college. That's actually an understatement. Um, it would take extraordinary political leadership to gain a public policy that would overcome those percentages. Can you imagine what kind of a leader it would take to convince the people 
that even though only a minority seem to benefit directly, the country benefits tremendously. Okay? That would be a very, very tough sell. The right leader may be able to pull it off. So I'm saying it's not impossible, it's just not likely. Okay. Everything you've heard so far has to do with the first assertion. Private, uh, the public universities in Pennsylvania are being privatized without a plan. That's the evidence uh, for that. All right, now, what is, what is the evidence for assertion two? That unless, in the face of this declining public support from the, from the Commonwealth, if we don't change our policies, that these universities face severe financial distress and bankruptcy in the short term. And I mean every one of those words. Well, the reason I didn't know about this until a few weeks ago is I, was, I just happened to be um, messing around with some data, and I received from my um, budget officer, uh, I asked her for something, and I got this spreadsheet, and I was staring at it, and I couldn't make sense out of it because, you know, 54 million, and uh, like the number, there were too many numbers. So I resorted to a trick I learned when I was a physics major, and it's called an index study, and it's really very, very simple. What you do is, I went back to the year 2003-2004, and because I don't want too much data horizontally. And I had a figure for how much money we collect. These, this, this is from the audited financial statements, by the way. So this is, right? These are the numbers, OK? Uh, and any school could do the same thing. And there was a number. It was a big number. I don't remember exactly what it was. And then there was a total ENG uh, amount. That was even a bigger number, because it has appropriation in it and some other things. I looked at the number of students, FTE students we had that year. I looked at what our personnel costs were in dollars. It was a big number, you know, millions. And I looked at what the state appropriation was. That was a big number. And I looked at the number of employees that we had. And with all of those numbers in the chart, it was hard to make sense. So what I did was I took everything in this row and I divided by the value in this year. And then you get very, very simple numbers. Same thing with this one. So, so how, do you, how do you use this? If you want to know what this number is, you just go back to the original list in the, in the audited financial statements. You can then recreate all the other numbers very simply. You just take this number and you multiply by 10% increase and 26 and 43 and so on. What you get is the cumulative effect. <clears throat> so by looking at this, you can really see some really neat things. Here's what you see. Tuition and fees, if 2003-04 was your index year, that's the number. Six years later, it was 93% higher. That's a pretty rapid rate of increase. In fact, what you can show, these, li these lines aren't straight, meaning that the increase is not the same every year. But you can get the average, and I did that. It's a little calculation with a, with a calculator. And you can show that if you had, uh, from here to there, seven years but six changes, you have to average 11.6% per year to get from 1 to 1.93. Okay, and I did that for all of them. So look at what it says. It says our tuition and fee revenue was going up by almost 12% a year. It says that our ENG revenue was going up by 9.4% a year. It says that our FTE students were going up at 7.1% a year. And it said our personnel costs were going up at about six and a half. And a state appropriation was going up by 5.6. Isn't that interesting? It looks as if the people in Harrisburg they know what our underlying personnel increases are, and it looks like the appropriation's been tracking it. And it tracked it beautifully, except for this last year. Okay? All right, so what's the point? Well, the point is, if your E&G revenue is going up more rapidly than your personnel cost, that says you're in good shape financially. It says you're going to have enough money to pay your bills. <clears throat> okay, so what did I do then? Well, here's some interesting facts about that. I told you this. I told you about this. Uh, there's, there's a category called other, that's interest, uh, that's fundraise money, and things like that. Okay, so there's plenty there going up 9.4% a year and so on. All right. Um, you notice that our enrollments were going up at 7.1% a year. Clearly that's unsustainable. You may remember the banker's rule. Uh, if something is increasing by P percent a year, if you want to know how long it's going to take to double, you take 70 and you divide by P. Okay? At 7% a year, you double in 10 years. So imagine, if we kept that up, we'd go from 9,500 students or 9,400 where we are now, we'd be at 19,000 students in another 10 years. There's no way we can do that for lots of reasons. So I'm saying, even though that rapid growth is helping us, it's helping us stay afloat financially right now, you can't, you can't make your living doing that. You cannot grow like that. Um, so 
It works in the short term. Um, by the way, even our state appropriation is going up because of our enrollment. Why? Because of the allocation formula. If you have 10% of the students out of the system, you get basically 10% of the appropriation pie, which of course is getting smaller, but it's still 10% of the pie. Okay. So, until, I already said that, personnel costs, notice we're, we're, our personnel costs were going slightly faster than state appropriation, which is pretty good. That would say appropriation was covering our personnel cost increases. That would be a pretty good situation to be in. But then it changed <clears throat> because there was a 13% increase in the last year. That's the early warning. That's how this index uh, study will help you know if there's trouble down the road. In fact, let me go back to that picture. Um, you can see, look at that purple line. Look, right? It was tracking along in, at this rate, and all of a sudden it perked up. Um, so that could mean trouble ahead, because if that keeps pointing up, eventually some is going to run into that. And when your personnel costs are increasing at the same rate or faster than your revenue, it's just a matter of time until you're bankrupt. It means you're going to eat away the little cushion, whatever you had back here. See, see how that works? So it, it gives you an early warning as to what's coming. All right. All right, let me go through these. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Really fascinating. There's, there's an interesting ratio that I, I monitor very carefully. It's called personnel percentage. You look at how much are you spending on personnel, and you divide by your total budget. And you'll know whether you're personnel poor or not. Because if you can be personnel poor, and you get to the point where you can't pay your bills because all of your money is committed to, to personnel. When we started the index year, 2003-2004, 83.5% of our budget was devoted to personnel. That means salaries, benefits, retirement, health costs, everything lumped in there. And of course, it also depends on how many employees you have, right? right? If you have more employees, you have to pay more of them, okay? So you take the total dollars spent on personnel and you divide by your total budget, 83.5%. But because, did you notice in that chart, our enrollments were going up at 7% a year. Our personnel was only going up at 3% a year. What's that say? That says we're getting more productive, right? More students mean more revenue. Fewer employees mean fewer expense. So what happened during that time? Our personnel percentage went from 83.5% down to 71%. And that freed up surplus funds, which could be used. In fact, they were used to, on, for the high quality end of our mission, right? You've got your personnel costs, you've got your mandatory transfers, debt service, pay your utilities, and other things like that. So when you lower your personnel costs by getting more productive, you now have some money to invest. And I mentioned the early warning aspect of this, okay? 13% increase in personnel costs in one year is a cause for alarm, is a cause for alarm. So I look, well, what happened there? Well, interestingly enough, even though the average over the six-year period was 9.4%, in that last year, even our revenue, even our ENG revenue, went up by 15%. So we're, we were staying ahead. All right, so in a short term, you can handle that, uh, but you only have this cushion, and you have to be very careful to watch your personnel costs, because those are the most rapidly increasing costs that you have. So what happens when you erode that cushion, if your personnel costs are going up more quickly than your revenue, it's just a matter of time until you go bankrupt. Uh, and I'm going to now show you a really dramatic situation, not that real one. I'm going to show you one that relates to what would have happened to Cal if we had kept our enrollments and our personnel numbers constant in the year after the year 2003-2004. And that's what it looks like. So you see FTE employees, and you see FTE enrollment. One's a green line, one's an orange line. Well, trust me, the green line's under the orange line. That's why you can't see it. And you have one, one, one for that one. Enrollment, see that enrollment stayed the same as it was back here. FTE employees stayed the same as it was back here. Okay, so look at everything else. Tuition and fees depends, is directly proportional to the number of students you have, right? You set your tuition rates, you multiply by the number of students, that's how much money you get. So if you divide by, if you divide out the actual increase in enrollment that you had previously, that'll tell you what your underlying tuition revenue is going to be if you stay flat, okay? So tuition and fees only goes up by 28% over that period, not 
Why? Because it's only the tuition rate increases that it's giving you any more money. You don't have extra students to pay. Total ENG goes up by, I can hardly see that, 14%. Okay, that's going to be a problem. Uh, personnel costs go up by 21%. Okay. Uh, and appropriation actually goes down. Why? Because the number of dollars had already been dropping. How come we got more appropriation money? Because when we increased our enrollments, we took it away from our sister institutions. Where's Fran? Is she here? Oh, you're, Fran's here. Uh, we talked about this today, and I promised I would fess up. Okay. Under, under the, not, she already knew. Uh, under, under this system, um, if you increase your enrollments, you get the tuition, which doesn't hurt anybody, but in fact, you get a larger share of the appropriation. But in this scenario, when you take out the increase in enrollment and keep it flat, that's what actually happened. Our appropriation is actually decreasing at 1.4% a year, and that doesn't even include deflation, right? That's just current dollars. But look at this. Tuition and fees still went up nicely, averaging about 4.2% a year. That's good. But to get to your revenue, you have to add together two things. What are you getting in tuition and fees, and what are you getting in appropriation? Well, appropriation eats into that. So that line right there, we're going up at 2.2% a year on average in revenue. Look at this. Just two years later, our personnel costs are higher than our revenue. So already it's eating into whatever cushion we had. And it never falls below. Right? This year it actually tied. They were both 1.09. They didn't cross. They one, that one's red, that one's purple. And then look at this last year, 8.1% increase in personnel costs having nothing to do with the number of employees. You know what that is. That was just the raises kicking in because the, when the contracts are negotiated, they tend to get little or nothing the first year, so usually the second year, and, and, and that year was the third year. The really big year is this one, and the raises are going to be large. So you're going to see another big uptick in that. Well, if we, had not, if we had kept our enrollments flat, what would have happened to us? We, we would have eaten into that. Uh, well, in fact, I'll show you. Uh, that's a scenario where it's flat. Yep, I already told you that. Had the enrollments not, uh, had they remained flat, we would have started to get in trouble two years after, back in 2006. The, those costs would eat, eat into and quickly erode the slim budgetary cushion. We were already at 83.5% of our money tied up in personnel. And then imagine if your personnel costs keep going up more quickly. So we only had a cushion of 16.5%, but we have debt service and other things to pay. You can't use all of that for personnel. So here are some interesting trends, I think. Our enrollment growth strategy would seem to be sustainable in the short term. The level enrollment strategy quickly leads to financial distress and bankruptcy. We would have been, Cal would have been bankrupt by now. We would have been insolvent, unable to pay our bills by now, if in fact we hadn't increased our enrollment. And so I say there's no need to simulate what happens to Apache school when their enrollments are falling. Just being level, you can't make it. And th there's something fundamental there. Here's why. We are structured in such a way that our personnel costs are cooked into the pie, right? We pay our faculty well. That's a good thing. We're setting our tuition rates so as not to burden our students. But when you mix in that appropriation is falling, what happens? You don't have to increase your enrollment. You don't have to increase your personnel. Your personnel costs are automatically going to exceed your revenue. That's a structural imbalance. That says what? Under this model, I think we're doomed. You, there's no way you can survive this financially. OK. Uh, oh, yeah, there's the structural imbalance I just referred to. Um, so our tuition rate increases have been wholly insufficient to cover the cost of our mandated, mandated personnel increases in a sustainable way. OK, it just, it just can't happen. <clears throat> now, I did mention personnel costs, and it's important to mention this. Faculty salaries are intimately connected to the Apache mission. Why? It is well known that faculty salaries are a great proxy measure for academic quality. All the rating magazines use your faculty salaries to come up with a measure as to whether you're a high quality school or not. They've done it that way for years. So the solution is not to lower the salaries to, to make your revenue cover your personnel costs because that's going to attack the other end of the mission. It's going to lower the quality of the right? high quality education. So you don't want to do that. You need to have more revenue 
so that you can preserve the mission of these universities with enrollments that are steady. You can't live with infinite growth. The only thing that grows without limit is cancer. <clears throat> My dad was a greenskeeper on a golf course, and I learned something interesting from him. He, he didn't have a formal education. <clears throat> but, um, you know, uh, dandelions are very special to Italians. They actually eat them in salads. But when you're a greenskeeper on a golf course, I, I didn't care for them myself. Uh, when you're a greenskeeper on a golf course, you want to get rid of dandelions. And they would put down weed killer. I never understood how is it that the weed killer kills the weeds and doesn't kill the grass. It's not toxic. Weed killer is not toxic. If it were, it would kill the grass. Weed killer is a fertilizer. It makes the broadleaf weeds, they grow so rapidly, they exceed the ability of their infrastructure to nourish them. So rapid growth is a killer. It's happened to companies. Companies that grow too rapidly very often get in trouble. Same thing applies to universities, okay? So, so you've got to have, you got to get to a point where this is how many students you can handle. So the growth strategy is not sustainable, okay? Remember I told you about the personnel percentage? When we were growing rapidly, we got down to 71%. I calculated the same thing for the flat scenario. What happened to our personnel percentage? And this will tell you what bankruptcy looks like. 83.5% of our budget was going to personnel that first year. By 2010, it was up to 89.1%. What's the difference between those two percentages? You subtract one from the other, it's 18% difference. Our budget that year, our EGM budget was $111 million. You take 18% of $111 million, that's a $20 million difference. That is, we would have had $20 million extra dollars to spend because we grew than we would have had if we had stayed flat. And we would be very close to bankruptcy. Here's why. Assume that 10% of the budget is mandatory. That's pretty conservative. It may be that or maybe a little bit more. That is, assume that 10% of your money, you can't go over 90% personnel. Why? Because there are certain bills you must pay or you, by definition you are insolvent. You can't, if you can't pay your utility, if you can't pay your debt service, you're insolvent. Okay. So at 71%, how much cushion do you have? You have 90 minus 71. Multiply by 111, there, there's 21 million. If you take 89.1 from 90 you, and you multiply it out, you get one, and that's where you get the difference of 20 million. So basically, you're getting very, very close to the point where you're gonna be bankrupt if your personnel percentage is that high. And why did it get that high? We didn't add a single employee. Why did it get high? It got high because your personnel costs are built in, the raises are built in, and your revenue is not increasing fast enough. Okay. There can be no conclusion, I say, but that severe financial distress looming bankruptcy would have soon followed any decision to keep our enrollments flat after 2004. Okay? I think that validates assertion, too. Here's, a, here's unvarnished truth, I think. The Pasha universities are being starved for funds. Some people may not believe that. They may think there's a whole lot of fat to cut. I don't, I don't think it is. I don't think there is. Look at what we have. We have four financial means to, to deliver the mission while balancing our budget. There's state appropriation, there's tuition fee and other, there's productivity increases, and there's privately raised funds. The largest one, state appropriation, 63 to 34%. And purchasing power has dropped by 39%. So our financial salvation is not going to come from that. Tuition and fee revenue depends on two things. What's your rate of tuition and fees, and how many students do you have? Well, because the rates have been held back, the only strategy available is to increase the numbers. But as, as we said, you can't sustain that in the long term. So the only way you can get enough revenue to cover your expenses is to grow. But when you grow, you, you impoverish the entire system. Okay? Our growth gave us money and took it away from the other universities. So the whole system is becoming impoverished. Not sustainable. Here's the only sustainable strategy, I believe. To keep our universities out of bankruptcy while preserving the mission, high quality, lowest possible cost to the students, we need tuition rates that are high enough to offset the personnel cost increases at constant, not growing enrollments. We have to find a way to do that. By the way, not bragging, but Cal U's productivities are, uh, productivity figures are the highest in PASHI. We started that years ago to save money, and we've saved a lot of money. But it's not going to make up for 27 years of disinvestment by the Commonwealth. And it's not going to make up for tuition rates that are too low, and I'm arguing they're below the market. Then the last one is fundraising. Hey, Fundraising at our place has increased by 500% in 15 years. It went from 1% of the financial aid pie 
to five. What's that tell you? That's a big percent increase, but it's not going to solve the lack of state funding or the lack of revenue that's coming in because our rates are too low. What I call tuition that is foregone. We're, we're going to forego that revenue by having rates that I believe that are too low. Okay, so private fundraising, wave of the future, but it's going to be years before we can make up for all of that. For political, as opposed to financial reasons, tuition rates are kept low, obviously, because people complain, but you haven't heard the whole thing. Um, I, I want to convince you, and it shouldn't be too hard, that PASHI tuitions and the rate increases have not come, kept place with the market, and, that's because, and I think that's the source of the, the dysfunction in our business model. Okay? Uh, I think it's, the model itself is forcing us into distress and looming bankruptcy. <clears throat> um, here's an interesting chart. This is PASHI tuition versus Penn State tuition for the last 10 years, oh, for which there were data. And you can get right on the Penn State website and find their tuition history. So Penn State started back here, 6546, got up to 13604. If you do the analysis there, the average of Penn State tuition over those 10 years, a little over 10,000. The average increase, the average yearly increase for Penn State is 8.3%. So their tuitions are leapfrogging by 8.3% a year. Now look at PASHI. Went from 37.92 to 55.54. The average over those 10 years is 47.63. It's less than half of the Penn State average tuition. Look at the increases, 4.4 compared to 8.3. Not quite twice as rapidly, but pretty darn rapid. And here's what you find out. Penn State's tuition average is more than double. Their increases are almost double, 1.9, not, 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 quite, not quite two. And if that situation continues for another 10 years, Penn State's tuition will go from being twice as big as ours to being almost four times as big as ours. I, th I say that we're missing the market. Also, think about the enrollments. Think about the enrollments. How, how are we able to have a 52% increase in enrollment. I can show you, in fact, it's not in the slides, it's in, in the, the, the version that's the long version. During a period of time, 13-year period, when PASHI increased its enrollments by 32%, 32 out of the 52% came in a certain period. During that same time, the Department of Ed showed that the number of high school grads in the state only increased by 15%. So think about that. The number of high school grads increased by 15%, but our enrollments increased by 32%. What's that say? We took more of the market. We were taking students away from the Penn States and the privates. That's what that means. How can we possibly be doing that? I think it's very simple. If your tuition is sufficiently low compared to the others, where are they going to go? What does, it, what does it mean when your, your business suddenly, uh, uh, right, you get more customers than you can handle? Usually it means your price is too low for your perceived quality. And I say we can't afford to forego the millions of dollars that are left on the table from a low tuition rates at a time of rapidly declining public support. If we're not getting it from this, we only have two major sources of revenue, appropriation and tuition. You gotta be getting it from somewhere. And without it, there's no financial viability. The noble mission, provide high quality, low cost, will have been reduced to empty words. And that would be a tragedy for those of us who care about these universities. And if you care about the mission, you care about uh, the students and so on. All right, what's the evidence for three? I'm gonna go through this more quickly. You've got the words there you can take home with you. This is what happened in a 10 year period. This is Cal information. 29% of their packages on the average were grants, 61% loans. Look at what happened 10 years later. There was an eight point swing. Grants got reduced by 21%, loans got increased by the same 8%. So basically the burden's being shifted onto the students. Here's a shocker. This is national data for all the schools out there. Look at the mix of, uh, 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 this is loans and this is grants to all institutions. So students nationally get a real break. Half their financial aid is they don't have to pay back. And the other half they have to pay back. Look at Cal students, 72% loans, 19% grants. You can't tell me our students are getting their education at the lowest possible cost to them because the other states are doing it differently. Here's, uh, here, here's a measure of the average debt that our students graduate with. And this was for one year, 2008-2009 uh, year. What is this? This is the line of average loan debt. Here's the range, zero to five. So 
the lowest amount that any student borrowed uh, in that category was on the order of $3,000. The highest was over $60,000. Uh, the average is about 22,004, and there's the number distribution. So more of our students had d uh, debt between 15 and 20,000 uh, than any other. But we still had, stu we had 15 students who borrowed more than 60,000. Uh, this looks at the national average debt for four-year public universities, and this is Cal's average debt. It's 25% higher than it is at the national level. How is that? Why is that? How come our students have to borrow 25% more uh, or, or have those kinds of debt? Obviously, something's going on here. <clears throat> and this, look at this. Um, this is the demographics of our families who uh, come to Cal. Uh, 10 years ago, a uh, little 3.5%, less than 3.5% of our students came from families making over 100,000. Then it went to 15%. That's a gigantic increase. Look at the next uh, wealthiest group. It went from uh, 12 to 19. So the wealthier families are increasing. Look at this category, making less than 40,000, went from about 60% down to about uh, 42%. So what's happening to us? I use the term gentrified. Some people uh, object to that, but uh, that's a quick way to remember it. Students from more affluent schools are coming to our university. What's that tell you? That tells you that, tells you that our value is perceived to be higher. Uh, that's what it tells me. Uh, and then look at this. This is the number of students in that, look at that poor category, zero to less than 40,000. The average salary in that mix, by the way, was 17, not even $18,000. So when we say less than 40, it covers a lot of territory. Look at this, over 100. The average was $136,000 and so on. So as the income level went up, the number of students went down. Okay, so most of our students are still poor, but this was the shocker to me. The amount of money they borrow is independent of how wealthy they are. I quizzed my financial aid director, how can that be? And he said, well, you know, these families making $100,000 a year, they're also spending it. So even their kids end up borrowing. The difference is they can afford to pay it back, as you'll see from this. This is the difference. Although they borrow the, approximately the same amount, for the poorest students, that loan is a third of the family income. How are they going to pay that back? And then, of course, as you get wealthier, if it's down to 7%, that's, that's pretty easy to pay back. Okay. So, anyway, uh, we began with three troubling assertions. I think the evidence is there to, to validate them. Next question. I wasn't going to leave you hanging, send you home depressed after that wonderful meal. Um, what, you know, what do we do? What can we do? I think we have to look at both what's happening with the universities and with the students because they both have financial challenges. Uh, and they're connected, and they're connected by tuition, and they're connected by the mission. Uh, so on the surface, it seems that higher tuition will help the university but hurt the students. That would be the rap that you'd hear immediately. You can't raise tuition because it hurts the students. Well, there's a fallacy there because it assumes that all students are the same, and they're not. There's a wide range of student family incomes. 17,000 to 136,000 or $137,000, you kidding me? That's a, you don't, we don't have one student. And the ability to pay off loans is not similar. That poor family is gonna struggle. Imagine if they had more than one child, they couldn't even do it. By the way, the disparity in incomes is a basis for how the private schools have done it for 100 years. They discount their tuition. Their sticker price is much higher than their cost to produce a graduate. What do they do then for the poor kids? They take the people who can afford to pay and they give some of that money as scholarships, they call them, to the poorest students. They're actually helping those poorer students. We call it need-based scholarship. It's a, it doesn't matter what you call it. I think that's the fair and ethical way to do it. And there's actually a board policy. The board just passed it about a year or two ago saying that we can use E&G funds to give scholarships. That was never possible before. The problem is we don't have any money. We, we need it to be funded. And how's it gonna be funded? We're gonna need a higher tuition to have enough money to save the universities and then be able to give scholarships to the poor students. So what's the, what's the call here? L look at that, that, that's the most shocking thing. Our students get sucked with the loans. Let's give our neediest students a fair opportunity rather than a lifetime of loan payments. So this shift, I think, means we have some affluent families that are getting a subsidy from the state. That's not smart, that's not necessary. For those families, our tuition is too low. And then look at students with debt between twenty-three and sixty thousand dollars. Those are our poorest students. For them, the tuition's too high. I say that the one 
the current policy is low tuition for everybody, it's a failure. It fails on both ends. It, it's leaving the poor kids stuck with debt, and it's giving the richer kids a, 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 a subsidy. Makes no sense. So politically, it's good to keep the rates low. Financially, low rates are going to make the universities bankrupt, and they will never be able to accomplish their mission. And who does that affect the most? It's going to affect the students. So, OK. Market rates are the norm everywhere, and so on. We should do them. Everybody else does them. Uh, and uh, I think it's artificially too low, and here's the best evidence I can think of. Rapidly increasing enrollments, that's a market signal that your tuitions are too low. Okay? If a hotel, if a business is getting so many customers that they ha can't handle them all, they say, gee, you know, we better raise our rates here. We're more valuable. And conversely, uh, you know, it works the other way too. The fact that we're getting wealthier students says what? We can warrant higher tuition. Our quality is perceived to be high. Okay? So anyway, I think the policy needs to be market rates of tuition generates the revenue. Scholarships for those students having the greatest need. It'll keep the universities solvent because otherwise they will go under, in my opinion. So I say replace that policy, expand and fund that new policy. There's no money to give to the neediest students. We have the permission, but we don't have the money. So, and that way you could give larger grants to our students and then live up to that lowest possible cost to the students. Remember, our students, right? You saw the, the disparity. In the, our students don't get grants that they get in other states. Well, I think that's how we give it to them. And the higher uh, uh, market rates will preserve that. And, uh, and we can actually live up to that, and that would honor and preserve the, the uh, uh, state system's mission. And I say, it's got to be us, <clears throat> the people who, who believe are the ones that have to do what needs to be done. These are great places of opportunity. I was a first-generation college student. I received two graduate degrees from Temple at a time when the tuition was 125 bucks a semester, and that was because the state was heavily investing in the state related at that time, not just, not just us. Okay, I, I owe my entire career <clears throat> to the education I received there. It's a shame that students today are not gonna get that opportunity because these universities are not funded. Anyway, I, I need to finish with the rest of the quote. Here's the rest of the quote. It wasn't just what's past is prologue. Here's the actual quote. Whereof what's past is prologue, what to come in yours and my discharge. So if you talk to a, a, a Shakespeare scholar, they'll tell you what that means in today's English. It would read like this. What's happened so far is preamble. What happens next is in our hands. And so it is. So I salute the chancellor, my colleague presidents, uh, I don't speak for them. We struggle to provide the mission. Thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer your questions.